The title of the next talk is really a question, why does gender equality and women's empowerment matters for inclusive and sustainable growth? And that's what the United Nations is saying, women can lead uh, the way to help the whole world achieve sustainable development goals. There is one issue also I forget to mention earlier, the journey towards 2030 or achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 has been hindered by the COVID. Two years, and the UN itself, the World Health Organization said, we are not out of this. And the UN uh, uh, World Health Organization said, we are not finished. We're likely to go through this for the whole 2022. So we are not finished. We're still going through this uh, consequence of the pandemic. So we got like three years, if not more, actually time cut off from our journey towards achieving the sustainable development goals. And that's where we need everybody. So let me uh, introduce the, uh, the third speaker. As I said earlier, uh, once we finish the third speaker, Professor Seema now, uh, we will take questions from the floor. Please make your question very short and straight to the point. And unfortunately we don't have a time for comments. So please make it a question. So I'd like to introduce Professor Seema Yoshi. Professor Seema is the professor of economics from New Delhi University. He's a well-established economist all over the world, well known. She has contributed in all fronts, conferences, uh, research papers, books, seminars, community, advising government. So uh, uh, she is one of the founder of WAS. She's been with WAS for many years. She contributed massively. She got many videos, many lectures, many, even she got her own book, all of them available. Professor Seema, it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, please go ahead and uh, you, you can share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Alam. First of all, I would like to express my heartfelt thanks to you for on organizing a conference on women, you know, on, and, and on such an important date uh, that is International Women's Day. And I would also like to congratulate all the women who are present here, that we are celebrating International Women's Day today. And it's a great opportunity which Professor Alam has given me to express my views on gender equality and gender empowerment. So I'm going to share my screen today. I think my screen is visible to all of you. Yes, just make it bigger, yes. I've been, yeah, excellent. excellent. So the topic which I have chosen for today's presentation is why does gender equality and women's empowerment matter for inclusive and sustainable growth? I have divided my presentation into five parts. First of all, I would like to discriminate between gender equality and gender empowerment because both these words terms are used interchangeably. I would also like to talk in brief about the status of women around the globe and try to identify major gender issues. My focus of attention today will also be on why women empowerment matters. And through the review of literature, there are several alternative paths to empower women which emerge and I have also tried to highlight that in my presentation today. And finally, I'll be giving my concluding remarks. Friends, gender equality and women's empowerment, these two terms are used interchangeably, but these are different. Because gender equality means equal opportunities without discrimination. And so far as empowerment is concerned, it implies the process of transforming the structures and institutions to ensure equality. Empowerment also means gaining greater control over one's own life. And when we gain greater control over our own life, there is an enhanced sense of self-esteem and that is at the core of empowerment. There are several dimensions which are required for facilitating meaningful empowerment. And Samantha, he has, you know, talked about four kinds of empowerment, economic empowerment, physical empowerment, 
psychological empowerment and empowering women in areas of time, technology and transport. Alsop and others, they have described individuals and groups as empowered when they possess the capacity to make effective choices, that is to translate these choices into desired actions and outcomes. If I talk about World Bank, World Bank is very clearly given the notion of agency. It says that empowerment implies control over resources, control over decision making, freedom of movement, freedom from the risk of violence in the voice and influence in the collective decision making processes. Keeping this difference in mind, if we try to find out what is the status of women at the global level, I think World Economic Forum, the Global Gender Gap Report gives you a true picture of what is happening around the globe. The Global Gender Gap Index, which is prepared by this report, it helps us to track progress towards closing these four gender gaps. There are four dimensions which are considered in the Global Gender Report. One of the dimensions is economic participation and opportunity. Another one is educational attainment. The third one is health and survival. And the fourth one is political empowerment. And if I try to, you know, find out where do the globe stands at present, what do we find is the gender gap in political empowerment, you know, it is one of the largest gaps out of the four gaps. And only 22% of this gap has been closed till date. And so far as the gender gap in economic participation and opportunity is concerned, only 58% of the gap is closed. We are doing well only in case of gender gaps in education attainment and health and survival. And if I talk about my own country, we are having 140th rank out of 146 countries and the COVID has worsened the situation so far as economic participation and opportunities for women are concerned. United Nations analysis of women it very, very clearly you know, brings out that women, they are, I'm quoting from this analysis, you know, uh, which was you know, quoted by Mary Collins in one of the reports. And it says that women are, to quote, half the world's economic population, but put in two thirds of the working hours, grow half the food, but receive one tenth of the wages and own only 1% of the world's property to unquote. So this quotation has been highlighting the gender gaps in ownership of assets, gender gap in the amount of efforts which are put in by women and gender gap in wages also. Despite you know the efforts which women put in, what is so bad is that women's, you know, their work, their unpaid work is till date not accounted for in the national accounts. It is invisible in national accounting systems of most of the countries, including my own country. And Mary Collins is very right when she says, to quote, that women's invisibility in national accounts belittles our role in the economy and society, chips away at our self-esteem, leads policymakers to overlook the impact of decision on women's lives and makes it difficult for women to achieve equality in our society, to unquote. There are time use surveys which are conducted, you know, to assess the amount of unpaid work which is done by women. Time use survey at the global level, it was started, it was done in 1900. In case of India, it was done for the first time in 1999. And recently, it has been completed in 2019. But you will be surprised to know the situation remains the same. Women do a lot of unpaid work, which is reflected in extended SNA in this particular table. And so far as men are concerned, they do most of the paid work. But this unpaid work, which is put in by women for caring of children, for caring of elderly, for taking care of the household maintenance, this work is not at all considered in the national income accounting system. And as all of you know, all women understand, men have been watching that we do reproductive work, 
bearing of children, rearing of children, nurturing of children. This is considered to be women's responsibility, especially in the developing economies. Household maintenance, care roles, whether care of children is concerned or elderly is concerned, this is considered to be women's responsibility largely. And this is not included in the national income accounting system of the country. Therefore, this amounts to gross underestimation of women's work. I like these words of Human Development Report, which was you know, uh, published in 1995. And the report very clearly says, once again, I'm quoting that women's vital social functions for maintaining families and communities, which become only too visible when juvenile delin delinquency rates rise, the elderly are left to die alone or cultural traditions wither would gain full recognition. Now considered largely women's responsibility in many societies, these functions would be recognized as the responsibility of both men and women, as well as of society. For public policy, this implies incentives, investments, and other measures to provide quality childcare and care for the elderly, to do community work, and so on. It means taking measures to ensure that men share more equally the burden of family life and community services. To unquote. So, but presently, the situation which is prevailing in most of the developing countries is that women have been, you know, doing dual work. They have been participating in the labor market at the same time, taking care of the children. And that is why there are several physical and mental health issues which, you know, women have been passing through in most of the developing countries, including India. And that is why United Nations Human Development Report warned in 1995 that the day women will stop doing it, the whole society is likely to suffer because the children will not know the direction which women provide to you know, children that would be lacking. Elderly will not be able to you know, take care of themselves because right now, most of the burden has been borne by women in the developing countries. There are some of the global initiatives which were initiated for gender equality. And I would like to mention a few of them. As all of you must be knowing, that gender equality, it was recognized as a fundamental right in the Charter of the United Nations, which was signed in 1945. The beginning of the UN Decade for Women in 76, it created a lot of interest in gender issues amongst academicians, researchers, policy makers, and international bodies also. In 1979, Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, it was adopted in the UN General Assembly and it was implemented in 1981. Thereafter, Millennium Declaration was there and Millennium Development Goals were signed by more than 180 countries. And Goal 3 and Target 4 of Millennium Development Goals, it was again related to gender equality which could not be attained. Then came the turn of Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2030. And if I talk of Goal 5 of SDGs, this once again refer to gender equality. Now the question is, why does women empowerment matter? Now, one of the reasons why women empowerment matters is because of fairness. Because even women deserve decent life. And World Bank is very right when it says empowering women means smart economics. It can enhance economic efficiency. It can result into better developmental outcomes. Because if gender equality is there and women are empowered, this can lead to the multiplication of development effect. The production will increase. Productivity, that is output per man will increase. It can also help in widening the tax base. And at the same time, it can also result into better contributions to social security, which is right now lacking. And when we look at you know, the aging societies in Asia Pacific or in the developed countries, I think it is the women who have to come to the labor market and, and contribute to social security more so that the governments can be, you know, because 
they are not able to you know widen the tax base because of political resistance also in some of the countries and therefore if women join the labor market this will add to the production productivity and also to social security there are several gains from gender equality which can be expected and these are the macroeconomic gains which can be experienced by countries through the development of women's full labor market potential according to an estimate that if more women participate in the labor market gdp of usa can increase by 5% egypt by 34% united arab emirates by 12% and japan by 9% and so far as india is concerned imf has estimated that in case of india gdp can rise by 27% if more women participate in the labor market the review of literature reveals there are different pathways or routes through which women can be empowered one of the routes is reduce gender gaps in human capital endowments that is by increasing more expenditure on education and health of women more benefits can be experienced another route which has been you know suggested in economic literature is that women should be given greater control over assets for example property or if they are working in agriculture sector so maybe you know agriculture tools and thirdly it has been suggested in economic literature that if socio cultural barriers are done away with especially in developing countries because most of the women are not able to participate in the labor market because of the social cultural barriers so if there is change in mindset if you know these barriers are done away with through information diffusion by expenditure on you know education then this can also lead to empowerment of women and greater gains can be experienced by different countries around the world world bank also suggest that women's time should be released this is another way of empowering women because right now women especially in the developing countries they are too burdened they have to do dual jobs they have to do take care of the homes they have to participate in the job market in case they are working therefore it's very very essential that their time should be released because right now the care of children and the care of elderly it is also the responsibility of women it is not you know uh, like developed countries of the world where formal care mechanisms are available and because of lack of institutional support in case of developing countries it's very important that women's time should be released so that they can also utilize their full potential in this lifetime i had done one of the projects for asian productivity organization tokyo and in that particular report i had suggested that by economically empowering women through ensuring their labor market participation you know several spillover effects can be experienced which i'm just talking of that if you know women participate in the labor market the income which is earned can be spent on education of the children health of the children and you know it can also release it can enable them to release their time for doing something you know productive which can give satisfaction to them which can enable them to fully utilize their potential and world bank and various international bodies they have been highlighting the need for this in different reports if you know world bank has been talking of you know smart economics that women empowerment is smart economics oecd has been saying that it is uh, you know it is economic necessity so international bodies have been understanding the importance of uh, gender equality and gender empowerment and they have been bringing to our attention that how women need to be empowered through policy interventions by the government through change in you know mindsets and if you know women are empowered if more women participate in the labor market there can be macroeconomic gains as i mentioned gdp can increase in the countries not only this there are several countries which are aging if i talk about asia pacific you find japan republic of korea taiwan singapore china they have been aging so these countries have been are likely to face in fact you know the small countries but high income economies like japan singapore taiwan even republic of korea they have been facing the shortage of labor force now this problem of 
shrinking labor force in this aging economies, it can be countered through higher participation of women in the labor market. This is likely to broader, broader you know, economic development of the developing countries. It can also contribute to rise in productivity and can help in optimum utilization of available talent pool. I would like to conclude by saying, again, I'm quoting from OECD and OECD in one of its reports in 2011, it said, reducing persistent gender equalities is necessary, not only for reasons of fairness and equity, but also out of economic necessity. Greater economic opportunities for women will help to increase labor productivity and higher female employment will widen the base of taxpayers and contributors to social protection systems, which will come under increasing pressure due to population aging. More gender diversity would help promote innovation and competitiveness in business, to unquote. And I will just, you know, before I, you know, um, hand over the session to Professor Alam, I would like to, you know, tell you briefly about India's labor market scenario also. In case of India, you know, over a period of time, what we have been watching is labor force participation rate has been declining and female labor force participation too has declined. And it is attributed to rise in income because more males are participating in the labor market. It is also because of, you know, lack of education or lack of suitable employment opportunities for women. It is also because of, you know, non-availability or less availability of infrastructure. So women, you know, they opt out of the labor market. But, and, you know, it has been noticed that most of the women are absorbed in the agriculture sector, followed by services and then manufacturing. And women, they are engaged in the informal sector where the situation, where the, you know, environment available to them is, you know, it's bad. It's quite, working conditions are quite pathetic. And as all of you understand that in, in informal sector, job security is not there. And there is no provision of social security or paid leave. So the quality of jobs indeed is questionable. But over a period of time, because of intervention by government of India, what we have been watching is that, you know, more and more women are participating. They are, you know, willing to participate in the labor market. At the same time, during COVID period, especially in 2021, there are 34 unicorns which have come up and 12 of them are led by women only. Though the number is less, but, you know, this is our, uh, the prospects for women participation in the labor market, women contribution to overall GDP is, is likely to be, it is likely to be high because the government has been trying to create a conducive environment for women through various schemes. There is, you know, Beti Bachao, Beti Badao scheme, which aims at spreading education amongst women. There is, you know, Ujula scheme. There are, you know, legislation through legislative measures also government has been trying to, you know, improve the condition of women. Not only this, the government has been trying to provide provision of paid leave to working women. So this is, you know, giving a ray of hope to all of us that the situ you know, the future scenario is likely to be better than the present one. And uh, there are, you know, certain changes which we have been observing more recently, as Professor Alam, you know, mentioned that there are very less number of vice chancellors, uh, women vice chancellors in the country. So what we have been watching in the country at present is that our, one of the leading universities, the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the vice chancellor, which has been appointed recently, is a woman. We can also notice that, you know, for the first time it has happened in the history of India, that the capital market uh, regulatory body, that is Securities and Exchange Board of India, it is it will be having, you know, its first chairperson for the first time. Not only this, in two of the leading PSUs of India, ONGC and SAIL, again, EDs are women. So this is giving us a ray of hope because this has been showing that the mindsets of the policymakers too has been changing. And I think it's very, very important because passing legislations is easier. Implementing them with a sense of commitment, it is, it is, you know, it was lacking. And we can observe over a period of time that the mindsets have been changing amongst the policymakers, amongst the politicians. And therefore, we are expecting 
for a we are expecting you know a better future for women in the times to come thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh, professor uh, sima as usual uh, well articulated and it's a pleasure to listen to you uh, thank you very much <music>